Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Isn't it a nice day to be here today? It's beautiful out there. It's beautiful in here. Let's turn the Word of God to Luke chapter 15, if you would. Luke chapter 15. We're going to read through verses 1 to 7. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, this is Jesus, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost." I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you. We thank you that you seek us. We thank you that we have a promise that you will lead us into all truth. God, I pray that you would do that today. Lord, that you would speak to us. We can understand that we can follow you. God, I pray for the other congregations that are meeting today in the many churches that we have in this community, God, that you would speak to the people there. God, sometimes we do find ourselves having strayed, feeling lost, but you seek us. And I pray that you would call us today that we would hear your voice, and that we would follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. You ever been to the Boundary County Fair? How many people have been to the Boundary County Fair? That's almost every. but do you love the Boundary County Fair? What's your favorite day in the Boundary County Fair? Auction day, because you make money. Okay, I get you. Uh, family fun night is my favorite day at the Boundary County Fair. I love it. I love it because they have the, the kids, uh, they do that sack race thing, and they do the, the tug-of-war thing, and they do the chicken scramble. Do you remember that? It's great fun. But my all-time favorite event is the mutton busting. You ever seen the mutton busting before? It's where these kids ride these sheep as long as they can. They hang on for dear life as these ewes run and jump and zigzag all over the place. It's the best. I know it's violent. I know it's probably invented by hospitals because they were short on their quota of fixing broken arms. I get that. But it's still one of my favorite events of all time. I think I like it so much because I get to watch the kids and then I get to watch the sheep. Like, like my favorite part is watching the kids hop off the sheep. And they're so happy and full of pride that they, they did it. My second favorite part is watching the sheep. Because they're hilarious. Have you ever watched the sheep after this event? Do you, see, do you ever see what they do? As soon as the kid hops off, what do they do? They start looking around. They start looking around frantically. They're like this. What's going on? What are they looking for? They're looking for the flock. They're looking for the flock. And as soon as they see the flock, they sprint to the flock because that's their security. That's their comfort. That's where they belong. Well, about two, year, two maybe three years ago, I was watching this. And a sheep zigged when it should have zagged. And it found itself on the other side of the arena from the flock. And the kid got off. And the sheep looked around, but it couldn't see the flock because in between this sheep and the flock was the trailer. You could see this sheep's distress. You could hear it because it started bleeding and bleeding immediately. It was panicked. 
Why? Why was it panicked? It couldn't find its flock. Sheep are the epitome of a herd animal. Did you know that? They are creatures of unbreakable habit. They're stubborn. They resist change. When they find themselves away from the flock, they panic and make really terrible decisions. And they follow. They will follow anything that they've put their trust in, whether it's the shepherd or a lead you, or their stomach leading them to greener grass. Now, i got to be honest with you. As I was studying for, for this message, I was like, man, Holy Spirit's really convicting me. And I was just reading about sheep. Because how many of those same traits do I have? Like, I'm stubborn. I resist change. I create these habits and these patterns that define my life. Is it speaking to anybody? When I find myself having wandered, I start to panic and can make some really terrible decisions. And boy, do we follow. We will follow anything that we believe will lead us to something better. And where we follow determines, what we follow determines where we're going to end up. So here's Jesus, and he's speaking to these Pharisees. And and what happens before he does in, in chapter 15 verse 1. All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. Tax collectors and sinners, they definitely followed something in their life, hadn't they? But it wasn't God. They'd followed, well, whatever it was, um, their lust or their greed or, or pleasure or freedom or a feeling or comfort. But where they ended up wasn't at all where they thought they'd end up. Have you guys ever done that before? You ever chase something, and then you, where you end up is not where you expect? What do you do in that moment? What do you do? You look around. You look for something. You look for anything that will bring you back to where you belong. You look for anything that will bring you that security. You look for hope. Are you looking for hope today? Maybe you zigged. You zigged when you should have zagged, and you zigged real bad. And now you're discovering that you're lost. But it seems like the shepherd's gone, and like he's not even looking for you. Look who it is who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the sinners and the tax collectors. He's drawing them near. you got to get this. These weren't great people. He's not rebuking them. He's receiving them. He's receiving them. He's not, he's giving them hope. He's not holding them back. That's what Jesus is doing. He takes even those ones who are burdened by their own panicked, bad decisions, and he calls them to himself. Just listen to Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you more work. He doesn't say that. I will I'll punish you for your bad decisions. He doesn't say that. What's he say? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Maybe you're finding yourself away from the flock today. Maybe you're finding yourself away from the shepherd today or struggling with some bad decisions that you've made. It happens. Jesus is not holding you back. He's not keeping you at arm's length. That's not what He does. He draws us so that He can heal us because He loves us. He's gentle. He's not yelling. Maybe you're so used to being yelled at for messing up, maybe you're so good at yelling at yourself, I know I am, that you started to convince yourself that all Jesus is going to do is yell at you. And that God cannot possibly accept you. That's how the tax collectors and sinners felt. That's what they've been told. 
That they were worthless. That they were beyond saving. And they started to believe it. It was a lie. There is not a single person in the world who is beyond the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It was a lie. But that's what they were told. He's not yelling at them. He's not screaming at them. He's not rebuking them. He's calling them. He's not screaming. He's drawing. Just like He draws us to Himself because He loves us. He wants us with Him. Now the Pharisees, they couldn't understand this. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You know who you ate with in this culture? It showed your status. It it was part of your identity. So if you ate with low people, you were a low person. So how could a rabbi, a teacher, Jesus, eat with the lowest of the low? How could he do that? Should he not have made his circle up of people who were at his status? Let me tell you something. If you want an easy way to create division, there's probably not an easier way to create division besides refusing to extend your circle. By identifying, this is my flock. You, get out. What's that do to the you? Distress. Isolation. Panic. And really terrible decisions. We need we. There's one flock. There's one body of Christ. And we're called to extend that. To include people. Here at Limitless, we believe basically three core values. Fellowship, discipleship, and outreach. It's in everything we do. And in everything we do, we should be looking to include those who are maybe not exactly like us. Those people we might not even value according to the world's standards. That is what's going on with the Pharisees. They did not value them at all. So Jesus, he spoke this parable to them. This is verse 3 saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? So here's the question. How in the world does a sheep, which only knows safety, comfort, and security in a flock, how does that sheep get lost? How does that happen? Well, it follows something. Just follow from him. It follows something it shouldn't have followed. Or it panics and makes a really terrible decision. Or it chooses to leave the flock. Have we all done some of those before? Every single one of us has been in those three places. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you have chased after something greener on the other side that you shouldn't be chasing. And you're like, but Brandon, I just got to follow my heart, man. If you are not being led by Jesus Christ, your heart is deceitful beyond all cure. And what you're chasing after is not at all what the shepherd wants to guide you to. It's drawing you away. From where He wants to lead you. Maybe it's dawning on you right now that there's some distance between you and God that shouldn't be there. And He seems really far away. Or maybe you have made a bad decision. Because those happen. And maybe you're feeling a little lost right now. It seems like you've entered into a wilderness that you don't even recognize. Or maybe you have chosen to put some distance between you and the flock. After all, the flock hurt you. And now you can't trust the flock all the way. It's better on your own. We can even get to the point where we feel so distant from God, from Jesus who's seeking us, that we start to actually believe that He doesn't care. That He's not looking for us. We start to believe That He's gone away and has left us to our death. 
After all, we did it to ourselves. Besides, how is he even going to know that I'm gone? I'm just one person. How is he going to know? How would a shepherd who owns a hundred sheep even realize that one is gone? How would they know? Have you ever thought about that? That would take time. That would take care, attention, listening. That would take watching. But check this out. Even a human shepherd, even a Pharisee with real sheep would do this. Listen to a real shepherd answer the question. How would, how does a shepherd know if any of his sheep are missing? Here's a real shepherd answering this. I listen to their cries. We pasture 30 sheep, seven lambs this spring, on 45 acres of pasture and woods. Each morning, while feeding my flock a small amount of medicated sheep food, I do a head count. The rest of the day, if someone is separated from the flock that doesn't want to be, that sheep will cry a distress call. Over the years, I have learned that the pitch and length of a call means something. A lamb separated from her mama sounds very different from a lamb stuck in a fence. A ewe calling for her lamb makes a different call from a ewe wanting to be let out to pasture. I listen for the distress, distress call, and then I go looking in the direction of the call. Once I found a sheep in distress, stuck on a stump, resting on her belly with all four feet off the ground. You can't make this stuff up. I've done that. That's a sheep with a head. I couldn't find one on the stump, but I found that one. If even a man listens to the cries of his sheep, how much more will the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, be listening to you? If you're lost, or you're hurt, you've wandered, you know you've turned away, you followed yourself or your own appetite, cry out, because he is listening to you. Just listen to Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Jesus is seeking to restore, to restore you. He's not trying to distance you. Don't try to convince yourself that you're fine and that you're okay on your own. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a condition that's worse than needing to cry out to Jesus. There's a condition that's worse than that. It's knowing you're in trouble and not crying out. Just listen to the rest of the quote because I didn't finish it. I listen for the distress call. Then I go looking in the direction of the call. I once found a sheep in distress stuck on a stump resting on her belly with all four feet off the ground. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Let me finish. A sheep that is sick and dying will wander away from the flock and not make a distress call, preferring to die alone, away from the flock. I don't know about the sheep, the sick sheep, until I do a head count and find someone missing. Sheep are very good at dying quickly when they are sick. This sheep knows it's in trouble. There's some of you in this very room who have something inside of you that's telling you it's better off to withdraw, to be alone, to just go off and die, to deal with the hurt on your own, away from the flock, and the flock would be better off without you. That's a lie. That's straight from hell. Don't listen. 
Jesus counts you. He knows you. He wants to know you. He is seeking you. Just listen to Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You are so valued that Jesus Christ would leave heaven and come down to earth to live as a man for you. To lay aside His power for you. To die for you. And to rise to give you life. In fact, if if you're the person who realizes they have this disease of sin, you are exactly who Jesus Christ came for. He says that. Luke chapter 5, 31 and 32. It's a glorious thing. Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Don't hang on to the disease that's killing us. Let Jesus take it from us. So he continues. Verse 5, And when he has found it, and the shepherd finally finds the sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Woo! Who's his audience? Who's he talking to? Because this is important. Who's he talking to right here? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's, talk, he's telling this parable. Did you get it right? That's okay. Sometimes we are Pharisees. <laughs> he's talking to the Pharisees. So he's, who's he, who he's addressing? So he spoke this parable to them, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the teachers. They were the religious leaders. They were the religious elite. They would chase one sheep, leaving 99 in the wilderness and celebrate finding this one sheep. Yet they were complaining about the very people they were called to shepherd. They were supposed to be the leaders of these people. They were failing. We're told that in Ezekiel chapter 34. It's powerful. Verses 1 to 6. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe! to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. This was their job. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away. You want to drive things away? Yell at them. Sheep are not led by yelling. Sheep are driven by yelling. You want to drive people away? Yell at them. Nor sought what was lost. This is the heart of God. He seeks the lost. It is our heart when we come to know Him. But with force and cruelty, you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. People looked to these Pharisees to interpret Scripture for them. They had Every opportunity to speak into people's lives. Every opportunity to lead them into the love of God. And yet they complained that these people even existed. I've got to be honest with you. It's real easy to complain about the people we are called to shepherd. It's real easy. Do you know that, that you've been placed here 
to lead people? That there's, there's people around you who you are called to shepherd? It's not just one person's job. We are all called to this. But it's real easy to complain about them. Even that, the guy at work who's always so rude, or that woman that you run into at the coffee shop every single time and she drives you nuts. Or your adult child who gets so angry and so bitter every time you even mention Jesus. Sometimes you just want to give up. You want to yell at them or just avoid them at all costs. But God values that person just as He valued us. He valued the lost so much that He sought them out at His peril. It cost Him His life. His life is what it cost Jesus Christ to seek after the lost. We should value the lost to seek after them. Our hearts should be changed to the point where we love them enough that it causes us to act. We're all called to lead people to Jesus by following Jesus and valuing what He valued. Not a single one of us is avoiding, <laughs> avoiding that level of calling because that's what we're here to do. It's really easy to complain about the people that we've been called to do that with. Don't complain about the people who have been placed in your life. Rejoice that God is using you as a model of repentance so that maybe they can follow Him. And when they do, we rejoice with them. I say to you likewise, verse 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now why in the world would there be more joy over one person who repents than 99 who don't need it? That one person finally gets it. They finally understand their condition. They understand they're in danger. They can't save themselves. And they turn in need of a Savior. They finally make it to the point of Matthew chapter 5 Verse 3 and verse 6. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They understand what they lack. Only God has what they need. And there's nothing in themselves that can fill them up with that. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They know they have none. They know only God can make them so. For they shall be feared, filled. We're not righteous on our own. There's nothing in us that can make us righteous. Before Jesus Christ, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. And when we wander, we need Him to seek us, to bring us back. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. They would consider themselves self-righteous. They'd consider themselves part of the 99 who needed no repentance. But they were deceived. They deceived themselves. They thought, if I follow the law close enough, then I will gain my own righteousness. It was a lie. Even following the law perfect would not make them righteous because it's not enough to clean what they'd already done. And their hearts were not right toward God. God searches the heart not just your outward actions. I don't care what you look like. How well you behave. Jesus says, oh, you're not a murderer? Have you murdered in your heart? You're just the same. It is a heart condition that Jesus comes to heal. It's a heart condition that has wandered and strayed. Not just your actions, the actions of your heart. What's going on in here? We prayed this morning for God to do heart surgery. That's exactly what He does through Jesus Christ. He performs it perfectly if we let Him. They would not let Him. They didn't think they needed it. They had no disease. That they were perfect and just before God on their own. This is how they were deceived. They did not realize their Savior was calling them. Begging them, just repent. Just turn to Me. And you're good. But they couldn't see it. 
they didn't understand their condition. They were still in the wilderness. If you want to break it down, just listen to Psalm 14, 2 to 3. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There's no one who does good. No, not one. Paul, for once in his life, actually makes it simpler. Usually it's pretty complicated. Paul makes it simpler in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are the one He seeks. Even when we wander, He still seeks us. Listen to the rest of Ezekiel 34, verses 11 and 12. For thus says the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. That is what Jesus did. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. He values you individually. Not just the whole flock. Every sheep in the flock. Everyone who is lost, he values to seek to bring him to him and back to him. Individually. The only way that we are just before God is by following the law. It does not do it. The only way we are just before God is by the imputed, placed upon righteousness through our faith in the finished work of the blood of Jesus Christ. That is a reason to rejoice. And you are rejoiced over. Who wants to be rejoiced over? Do you not? Thanks, Dan. Saw you up there. In the sound booth. What's the sheep's response? What does the sheep do? I saw this. This was great. Two or three years ago as I was watching the mutton busting and the, the ewe zigged when it should have zagged and ended up on the wrong side of the arena with the trailer between that ewe and the flock and the young man stepped off with pride and that ewe spun its head around looking for the flock and it panicked. A young man from 4-H tried to walk up to the ewe to lead it to the flock. It panicked. It turned. And it ran right through the fence, in between the arena and the fence that's right outside of it, and it got stuck. And it was screaming like crazy. And the young man hopped the fence, went up to the ewe, gently lifted it, carried it through the gate, up to the flock, and set it down. What did the sheep say? Well, upon interview, the sheep said, bah, true story. The sheep had just made it in its mind from certain death into life. For the sheep, this was a miracle. It is a miracle. Our salvation, our redemption, our repentance is a miracle for how is a sinner away from God, going to be saved? How is a sinner, away from God, even going to come to repentance? Just like Israel, after leaving Egypt, gets gets chased by the entire Egyptian army, the most powerful army in the world at that time, and gets pressed against the Red Sea. They turn their back to the death, trying to devour them toward what God is doing as God split the Red Sea. They walked away from certain death on dry ground. So we turn from the sin that is trying to conquer us and devour us to Jesus Christ who made a way with His death on the cross splitting the veil so that we can walk away from certain death. That's what He did. And even though we're led through valleys, even the valley of the shadow of death, just like God did not leave Israel in the wilderness, He never leaves us. Ever. Listen to Psalm 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? 
Why is David not fearing evil? It's right there. Why? For you are with me. God is with him and he knows it. This parable is not about abandonment. It is about repentance and reconciliation. Just listen to Hebrews 13 verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that I have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You're the one he searches for. And when he finds you, he takes you and puts you into his father's hand where none can snatch you out. You're loved, valued, sought after. He doesn't leave us. He leads us. And he leads us to something. Just like God split the Jordan River and had Joshua lead all of Israel over on dry ground into the promised land, into life. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, making a way with His resurrection to lead us into eternal life. Is that not a miracle? It's a miracle that God made a way for us to escape death. A miracle that God led us into life. And it's a miracle that He leads us into repentance. That we can even turn to Jesus Christ in faith. That He fills us with the Holy Spirit who allows us to overcome the sin and the death that once stranded us in the wilderness and make a way for us to walk into life. We follow Him. Question. Do you think that Israel remembered crossing the Jordan River into the promised land to their dying day. Do you think you'd remember that? If God split the river and you walked across it, (laughs) what? Into the promised land that had been promised to you for over 400 years. Would you remember that? Not only did they remember it, They memorialized it. They built an altar of remembrance to this. To the defining moment of their lives. To this defining moment in their relationship with God. A defining moment of what God had done. Joshua built a monument to it. Took 12 stones in the river, stacked them up, and here they are to this day. I don't know where they are now, but back in the day, they had those still. They told their children about it. The lost sheep, if it could... It would have built a monument to when it was pulled out of isolation and death brought back into the fold and life. When we are brought out of the wilderness, when we are saved, when we come to repentance, when we wander, it is a defining moment. We should memorialize it. It should cause us to bear the name of Jesus Christ with pride. To not hide it. It should change our hearts. It should change our lives. It should change those hearts for, the, for those around us. It causes us to act for them. Your very life is a monument to the work of God in you. We're called to share it. We're called to write it down. We're called to speak about it. We're called to be excited about it. We're called to remember it. Do we remember it? We're called to remember what God has done. And to follow Him. Maybe you've been saved. Maybe you've wandered. Maybe God has pulled you out of a wilderness. Or pulled you out of a ditch. If God's pulled you out of a ditch, don't do this. I could watch that all day. Let's do it again. Come on, I guess see this again. That's us. Woo! Okay, thank you. Don't do that. So many times. We get pulled out of a ditch only to run right into another ditch. Sometimes right back into the same ditch. How do you avoid that? Stop. 
Wait. Listen. Follow. If you get pulled out of a ditch, stop. Don't start running again from Jesus. Chances are, you're going to run right into another ditch. That's the truth of it. Stop. Wait. Your shepherd will speak to you. If you stop what you are doing and what you are chasing, listen to him. Drown out the noise of your life and identify the voice of your shepherd. Read his word. Spend time with him in prayer. And lastly, follow. This is the hard one. This is the hard one. You see, we're called to lead people to Christ. But we cannot do that if we are not following Jesus ourselves. It is impossible. Lay down your agenda for Christ's agenda. We follow Him. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, I can't, Brandon. I can't. I can't follow Jesus. I can't repent. Because there's no way that He's ever going to accept me. So you're sitting here holding on to the very thing that's drawing you away from Jesus when all He wants to do is heal you. I want you to listen to verse 1 again of chapter 15 of Luke. Just listen to verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Him to hear Him. He's speaking to them. Jesus is speaking to you. He's calling you. Listen to Him. Listen to His plan for you. Listen to John chapter 10, 27 to 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. My, I and my Father are one. When we repent, we are rejoiced over confessing your sin doesn't keep heaven from rejoicing. When we confess our sin, God is not shocked. He is not like, wait, you did? He knows we have all sinned. When we finally realize that moment and we hit our knees before the only one who can take away our sin, that is when God can work. That is when heaven rejoices at the end of us and the beginning of the enormity of God and His grace and His forgiveness. Let God rejoice over you. Let Jesus lead you into the restoration that He has planned for you.